Greetings, my name is Dr. Robert Gish. I'm here to present to you today, as a patient, what is cirrhosis? This is a scarring process of the liver, and we're gonna dig pretty deep into this area to help educate you, your loved ones, your family, your support individuals on what this may mean to your current or your future health. First off, the liver is located under the right rib cage. The gallbladder is highlighted here, and we note that the liver is up to about one and a half kilograms or maybe three pounds. It's a very complicated organ. It has been recognized back as far as the time of the Egyptians. This is a little bit better drawing now. Here we have a diagram where the abdominal uh, wall is taken away, the, the chest, the ribs, and we can see here the liver and spleen Two things that we're going to look at on physical exam or feel for on physical exam and look at on imaging such as CT or ultrasound. We're going to measure what's called the portal vein. Obviously we're going to look to see if the gallbladder is there. We're going to take a look at the stomach, although that's usually not seen very well unless you have an endoscopy where you swallow a, a fiber optic tube. Behind the stomach is the pancreas. Food moves through the stomach through the intestines, which are not shown on this diagram eventually going through the colon. So this is a great starting point to understand where the liver sits and where it is in relationship to other organs in your abdomen. The next important part of this is to talk about liver tests. Most providers that you may meet really group and put liver function tests together with liver enzymes. So let's talk about liver enzymes first. Over here we have two tests, AST and ALT. When those are elevated, they don't mean your liver's not functioning, they mean that the liver's irritated or inflamed. Two other liver enzymes, alkaline phosphatase and GGT, might mean injury from fatty liver, a blockage of the bile tube, or maybe somebody's drinking too much alcohol, although they're not really specific and they lead us to doing really further testing. Here's what are true liver function tests. Bilirubin might make your eyes yellow, albumin keeps you from swelling up, and INR is a clotting test to make sure your blood clots adequately. And that's how you're gonna monitor, if you have cirrhosis, how your liver is functioning long-term. The liver is a unique organ with blood coming in both through the portal vein and the hepatic artery. So there's an artery coming in, a vein coming in, and then there's another vein leaving the liver, the hepatic veins. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. Let's take a look at what a liver looks like after a liver transplant. Here we have a normal liver inside someone's body. The abdominal wall has been lifted up here on the right and left side. And down here we have fat that's in the mesentery or the part of tissue that surrounds the intestines. But if you have a lot of fat here, it might put fat in the liver and cause fatty liver. And we'll talk about that under our presentation on NASH or fat in the liver. The liver has segments, eight segments, and it's really easy to remember these. They're numbered one, two, three, four, like a clock on the left side, or five, six, seven, eight, another clock on the right side. This is important if you have a liver tumor and if there's a lesion or an abnormality in your liver, think about that segmental anatomy, ask your provider where your tumor is, and this is obviously helpful to surgeons when they're doing their surgical resection. When you cut across a normal liver, you're gonna get this type of surface where you're gonna be able to see these little collections of blood vessels and bile tubes. But as you can see, there's very little white material that's here. This white on here is basically what's carrying blood vessels in and out. And that liver is gonna be about 12 centimeters high, about five inches, soft, pliable, smooth surface. You take a microscopic picture inside that liver, now we have a cartoon. We're gonna look in what's called the portal area. We talked about that before. Here we have a bile tube. Here we have the portal vein and hepatic artery. Blood from the artery, blood from the vein goes to the hepatic vein, and that goes back to the heart for recirculation. Bile is gonna leave here and go down to the gallbladder and help with food digestion. So it's important to know this structure. And then we're gonna move now to a picture of a real liver biopsy. Here again, we've got that portal area, 
We're going to see how much inflammation is here, whether there's any interface damage, and we're going to look at the liver cells. Do they have fat? Are they normal? Are they dying? Are they inflamed? And we're going to look at the central vein. Again, blood flows this direction back to the heart. We have to have this in our brain when we're looking at your liver biopsy or one of the patients that we're seeing who's had a biopsy to help decide on how much damage they have. Chronic hepatitis. What does hepatitis mean? Inflammation of the liver. Inflammation means collections of pus cells that are directly damaging cells. This liver cell is dying here. This person probably has too much fat in their liver, either from being overweight or from alcohol, but inflammation is present. Hepatitis doesn't mean you're infectious. Hep doesn't, hepatitis doesn't mean you're drinking too much. You have to go back to your provider and say, what's damaging my liver? What's the proof? What tests do I need? Here's a little bit more detail on something called fatty liver, but we're going to talk about that more on a different presentation. But pretty soon, fatty liver is going to be the number one cause of cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver transplant in the United States if we can't have people change their behavior. These fatty collections that are here lead to this scar formation that's in blue, and eventually that person can get so much scar tissue, which you see again on this cartoon. And this may be what you see also with virus or with alcohol, uh, the immune system. But the last thing that you want is cirrhosis, and that's what's shown on this diagram. Really irregular, bumpy surface. You can see how this is all set up. The liver is shrunken in its size. It's not working well. Uh, again, a lot of scar tissue. This is a liver that is uh, very, very sick, and this patient is going to do very, very poorly. Normal liver again. You can see it looks very much like that cross-section that we had on the previous presentation and slide. Here's a patient who's having a laparoscopy, which means a tube's going into their belly. You can see the surface of a liver is really lumpy bumpy. This person drank too much, but you can't tell that from looking at the surface of the liver. You have to go back and get a good history because hepatitis C, autoimmune, a variety of causes can make the liver look this, this sick, this bad. Another picture, normal liver. Below this, cirrhosis. Over here on this side, we have what are called the stages of liver disease. This scale is going from zero to four. Four, you see nodules, that's when we have cirrhosis. Ask your provider, what's the stage of my liver disease? Stage one clearly has a much better prognosis than if you're between a three and a four. And of course, you need to know the cause. It's another picture cutting across a patient who has early cirrhosis some areas with early nodules, other areas that are nearly normal. So again, borderline cirrhosis, early cirrhosis, advanced fibrosis. We want to know what their liver function is through blood tests. This could be hepatitis C, but this could be many other causes that make the liver look like this. Another nice cartoon. This is provided by the AGA slide deck. And this really shows what happens on the surface of the liver again, lumpy, bumpy. Blood here cannot get through the liver, so it's going to back up in the portal vein, go to the spleen. The spleen is going to get very enlarged, and your platelet count, which we'll talk about later, is going to go down. There may be varices or veins that are dilated in the stomach and the esophagus, and your provider will ask you to have an upper endoscopy to score or grade these veins and potentially do interventions like putting little rubber bands on these if they're really dilated. This portal vein should be less than 12 millimeters. The spleen size should be less than 12 centimeters in people who do not have cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis. Another picture, a cirrhotic liver, lots of dilated veins, varices in the esophagus, and you can have, of course, blood that backs up down into other blood vessels and other uh, areas of the body. Again, looking at a patient who's got dilated veins here, and this might actually show up on the abdominal wall as dilated veins around the umbilicus, around your belly button, you might get dilated veins that look like a caput medusa, like in the old um, Greek mythology where these veins look like uh, the head of Medusa. 
People can also get hemorrhoids and get uh, varices in the rectal area and have lower bleeding from that. We've also talked about measuring the spleen size and looking for varices or dilated veins in the intestines. This may interfere with digestion, low flow, food intolerance. Here's a look in somebody's esophagus. This person swallowed a camera. This is normal. Here we have somebody with early cirrhosis with little veins. Here's somebody with advanced cirrhosis with large veins. And this is definitely somebody who we're going to put rubber bands on those veins to prevent them from bleeding. Complications of cirrhosis can include mental confusion that we call hepatic encephalopathy. But we do not, in our practice anymore, check ammonia levels. People who uh, check ammonia levels are more confused than their patients because they may be high or low and they don't correlate well. So no ammonia checking. People can bleed internally, which we just talked about. Very late, patients' kidneys can shut down because the liver regulates the kidneys. People can collect fluid on their abdomen called ascites, and eventually that can become infected. The P here stands for peritonitis. This is a patient who has cirrhosis. You can see the dilated belly with fluid, yellow eyes, yellow skin, spiders on the chest, muscle that's uh, mar markedly wasted. Men may have breast enlargement. There may be on uh, men, again, testicular atrophy from decreased testosterone. So we always check testosterone levels in our patients with cirrhosis. There may be bruising or easy bleeding on the skin. We always check the ankles. We check to see what the hair pattern is. We always want to see if somebody has clubbing of their fingers. We look for hernias. We look for what the liver feels like. And it's important also just to do a general exam of that patient, see how their brain is working. Nutrition. Really the biggest issue here is in people with cirrhosis <clears throat> or people with fatty liver. Let's talk about patients with cirrhosis, though, in this specific uh, presentation. Malnutrition is a big problem in patients with cirrhosis because really to keep your nutrition up, you have to eat six times a day. That means six snacks, and you need to be taking in 100 grams of protein. We'll talk about that in more detail. Make sure your provider checks for vitamin and nutrient deficiencies and replaces those if you're deficient. Here's a little bit more detail. People aren't eating as much. They may not be digesting their food well because of the portal hypertension, that congestion. They may not be absorbing because they're not making bile acids like they should. Glucose, people who have cirrhosis have low blood sugars during the day. Again, six times a day, you're gonna have snacks to help keep your nutrition in good shape, as well as 100 grams of protein People with cirrhosis are really hypermetabolic. We want snacks at bedtime. We want a breakfast early in the morning. An overnight fast for 12 or 14 hours in somebody with cirrhosis is like going for three days in somebody who's healthy. Frequent meals we talked about. Complex carbohydrates. That could be rice, bread, pasta, potatoes. We talked about protein intake, which is very, very important as well. Go, go towards vegetable type protein and away from red meat type protein. Calcium is important, 1200 milligrams a day. Men who are testosterone deficient, we're gonna do replacement. We want low salt, less than two grams a day. Very important to decrease uh, fluid retention. And again, nutrient replacement vitamin replacement, very important. We then score all of our patients through what's called a CTP score. This is Childs, Turcot, Pew. These are three different doctors, two of whom I think were surgeons. And they looked at the bilirubin, albumin, coagulation, ascites, and encephalopathy, and came up with a point system. So everybody really has a score from five to 15. If a patient's at 15, they're really sick and need a transplant really quickly. MELD score, now even more important than the CPT score. This is used to allocate organs and calculate a three-month mortality rate 
or you want to turn that around, three-month survival rate. So kidney function, bilirubin, and coagulation. And there's MELD calculators on the internet, uh, especially if you want to go to the UNOS website. If we're trying to calculate somebody's brain function, we're going to ask for their signature. We're going to ask them to count numbers. But we're going to ask them to stick out their hands and see if their hands flap or not. That flapping means a buildup of toxins, which can include ammonia. That helps us score how bad their liver function is and whether they need to be in the hospital. To prove that somebody has cirrhosis, the gold standard is a liver biopsy. But interestingly, once we figure out somebody has cirrhosis, we don't do liver biopsies that often. But here's a little bit of information on that biopsy issue. We're sampling a small amount of the liver, but interestingly, we only miss cirrhosis maybe 3 to 5% of the time. We need adequate length of biopsy. We usually get two passes. Definitely standard of care is a 16-gauge needle, not 18-gauge as is often used. We want to know some history, but we may determine the etiology by biopsy. The biopsy is a tiny little needle that passes into the liver under ultrasound guidance with a little bit of local anesthesia put in ahead of time, and it takes out a specimen that we analyze. Of course, we're going to do this under ultrasound because we don't want to hit the gallbladder, we don't want to hit the lungs, we don't want to hit the kidneys. We can take a biopsy through the neck vein. That's called a transjugular liver biopsy. Here's a picture of taking two passes of the liver. And you see we want to get two passes because the level of fibrosis here in blue may be markedly different between those two passes. So two passes is also standard. You want to get about three centimeters of tissue. Make sure you ask your provider if enough tissue is obtained on biopsy to make an accurate diagnosis, grading, or staging. How bad, how good is the liver? Here's some examples of a really poor biopsy. Tiny, small fragments, can't really tell much. This biopsy is pretty good, but it's also pretty thin. We may have trouble getting full architectural assessment. You can watch a liver biopsy on YouTube by going to this website. A colleague, colleague of mine, Dr. Dietrich in New York City, will walk you through the actual liver biopsy process. We cover biopsy, I think, in more detail in one of our other presentations. So uh, look at our liver biopsy uh, slide presentation, if you would. A tip shunt. We'll have a full presentation on a tip shunt, but this is where we put a tube into the liver to decrease the pressure here to control either ascites or GI bleeding from varices. This is a little bit more of a diagram on that tip shunt, how it goes through the liver, what we leave in place, enhancing blood flow. A Levine shunt can go into the belly and recycle ascites back towards the heart. But quite frankly, we probably use one of these every one to three years because there's a lot of potential complications, but it's something to think about in somebody who's got terrible ascites and there are no other options. Another picture of a shunt called a Denver shunt that's used here to recycle fluid back to the heart. In conclusion, cirrhosis is the final common pathway for many diseases. Often, but not always fatal, it is commonly but not always preventable. Understand your risks for cirrhosis, or if you have cirrhosis, your disease state, and look for guidance on how to manage, prevent, and if you need a referral for a transplant. Very important. If you've got cirrhosis, you need to have a scan every six months to look for cancer. Most commonly ultrasound, but sometimes we, other, we use other scans and work with your provider to enhance your quality of life. Thank you very much.